Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our third webinar for our historical argumentation webinar series. We have been really excited to work with so many teachers over the course of this semester and so appreciative to the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Source Consortium for making the program possible. So tonight we're going to be talking about argumentation and evidence. And this is kind of like the transition piece. How do you go out of the research phase into crafting something that's real history? Couple things to kind of help you get going. Housekeeping. We said we have our chat box open tonight. We're going to try that. We also have a question and answer box. My question is if you have a specific question that you'd like us to answer, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. Ashley's going to try to keep track of both, but that's a little challenging. So questions in the question box, comments in the chat box. We'll have the survey at the end, just like the other two webinars. You've got to complete the survey and turn that in to get your attendance credit. We will have the video and the slides posting up to Google Classroom tomorrow. We've also got the bibliography with all the sources if there's anything that you find particularly exciting. So here's what we're working towards. The goal by next Friday, by March 19th, is to have a draft argumentation plan. This is really a graphic organizer to outline the shell of an argument. And this is hard, right? This is that transition piece where we're trying to get you out of just gathering and analyzing and into the construction phase. We have placed a full model for you in the folder that has the women's suffrage documents that I'm going to work with tonight to create my sample. I've posted a completed argumentation plan. Now, you can't take it and turn it in because it's my plan and it's a different set of sources, but it will give you a model to follow to help get you started. And then our last module, the last one, we're almost there, will launch that same afternoon. Now, one thing, we know that this transition is hard. So we are going to offer two opportunities for live office hours. Ashley will be there. I will be there. We might both be there at certain points. But our goal is to help you. So if you're getting stuck, if you're not, if you made a revision on a thesis. Now, I'm going to be honest, we can't grade your argumentation plan. But we can answer specific questions or give you specific feedback. So we're going to offer two sessions next week on Tuesday and Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to post a Zoom link in Google Classroom if you want to join. Now, if this time does not work, we know that we've got people in different time zones and it may not work. If you need help, I want you to send me an email. And in that email, I want you to give me times and days where you can be available and how best to contact you, whether you want us to send you a Zoom link or a phone number where we can reach you. And we will coordinate to make sure that one of our team members, whether it's myself or Ashley, whether it's one of our facilitators or Christopher, will get in touch with you. So we'll coordinate on our end. But if you can come to office hours and you need help, you're welcome. We'll post the links tomorrow to make those available. Obviously, these are optional. There is no requirement to be here. But if you need the help, we're here to help you. We know this is a tough spot. All right. With that, I'm going to stop my sharing and turn things over to Christopher. He'll give you a little sense of what our plan is for tonight and how we're going to split our hour. Yeah. So welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you. And this is the, the week that we're starting to make this transition, as Lynn said, from thinking about sources to putting those sources into an argument and in writing. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about thinking about that and doing some diagnosis on your own writing and that'll help lay the foundation for our final uh, module next month. But really I am the opening act tonight. So Lynn is gonna take the bottom half of the hour and give you some, a great way to think about and map out arguments that you can use and that you can pass on to your students. So save your good brain cells for the second half. Uh, I'm going to talk in kind of broader strokes about some of the processes that, that I go through as I'm doing this. Remember, we're interested, no matter what topic, in change over time. Uh, we've already talked about historical thinking skills for working with individual primary source documents. And then we've talked about some tools that historians use, perspective and agency and hindsight, to try to understand how those things fit together. So hopefully you've, you've gotten some good repetitions in working with sources first individually and then fitting them together in groups. Um, if the theme of the entire program is the 
the transformation of raw material into finished product. Um, the first two webinars kind of dealt a lot more with the raw material and the last two are going to deal more with the finished product. So if you're wondering about what is happening in the, in the kitchen, like this is the moment when the meal starts coming together. I want to start that conversation by reflecting back quickly on two things that seem to come up a lot on the module two assignment. So we'll start there and then we'll have a super smooth segue into thinking about diagnosing your writing and your students' writing. The first question that seemed to come up quite a bit was the distinction between primary sources and secondary sources, not the differences in which is which, but questions uh, about, you know, well, can't I just use the secondary source as, uh, as my citation? And we're all familiar with that, right? I'm teaching the Civil War right now, so you're gonna have to indulge me that a bunch of these examples are Civil War examples because I've got Civil War on the brain. Uh, but here's a page from a Pulitzer Prize winning book um, that describes what was going through Lincoln's mind in the late summer of 1864. And it's well-written and it's accurate and you could cite to it. But remember, every secondary source has a primary source or primary sources underneath it. Um, the secondary source comes from the historian's engagement with primary sources. And so this is a case where there's a footnote that will lead you back here. Now, do you have to cite the primary source? Not necessarily. I mean, this would be a sentence that you could see in a student paper, you know, as one historian wrote, Lincoln fully anticipated defeat in November on this platform. Okay, but referring back to the primary source goes right back to the historical moment and the historical actor and their language. And to me, this is so much more powerful, right? Because instead of getting it filtered through some other historian, we're going directly back to the source, the original source. And that's just much more powerful and so, every chance you get and every chance you can encourage your students like i think this is really valuable to encourage them to do that extra work i'm like the last guy still buying cds on amazon you'll see this stuff all the time in the little record reviews like this to me is the secondary source right this guy says oh it's terrific it's going to change your life fantastic all right mike from akron i guess that's useful but any chance i get instead of just taking his word for it I want to click on the sound sample. Like, let me just hear it so I can make up my own mind. And that's the great thing about bringing everything back to primary sources and primary documents is you're, you're removing the filters between your audience and the source material. Second thing that seemed to come up quite often was some concern or, or you know, lack of comfort with counter evidence, which is totally understandable. These are things we all struggle with. And I think with counter evidence, there's this concern. I, I feel it sometimes when I'm writing and I know I can see my students feeling it. Like, well, if I put in counter evidence, then won't I be undercutting the argument I'm trying to make? And that's a very intuitive way to think about things. Um, if you were trying to make an argument that Thomas Jefferson was a, a believer in human freedom and equality for all, then this would be a great primary source to hold up that language in the declaration, which puts those ideas right in front of your reader. And if you're doing more research, you might say, oh, uh oh, I found this, which seems to suggest that there is a large caveat attached to Thomas Jefferson's belief in human freedom and equality. Like maybe I should just bury this. Maybe I should just pretend that I didn't find it. Maybe I should just kind of hide it. Uh, or not mention it, at least, because if I bring this up, it's going to undercut my main point. I sometimes talk about um, the practice of law, which has some things in common with, with history. And in law, there is a, an ethic that requires you to turn over everything you found. That process is called discovery, and you find yourself in trouble with the Bar Association if you hold things back. For historians, there's also a kind of ethical thing, like you are, you are beholden by the, the norms of the profession, to put everything you found out there. But I think there's a better reason to show counter evidence. Um, and that's because it, it creates nuance and subtlety. And it shows that you've done a lot of research and that you can appreciate the figure or the organization that you're writing about in its fullness. Like historians do not need to see black and white. We love shades of gray and we love subtlety and we love nuance. 
So let's kind of come back to the set of sources you guys have been working with. You could go through some of those sources and say, okay, I'm gonna make an argument that religious belief in centrality of family, that's what was driving the temperance movement. And you could absolutely find sources that would back that up. And, and that would be a good argument to make. If you keep going through that packet or you go you know, even deeper in the Library of Congress collection, you find a bunch that are pretty passionate about prohibition or pretty passionate about temperance, but aren't making a religious argument and, and maybe aren't making an argument about family. So what do you do? I mean, you could say, well, I'm just gonna pretend I didn't find that. I'm gonna just focus on the documents that support what I wanna say. Um, or you could say, well, what's the argument of these documents? Which is like, well, there's another thing out there that too much alcohol is gonna weaken the country. And then good historians, instead of like trying to sort of see this as like, well, it's all black or it's all white, we look for that shade of gray. So we could go further and say, it's both, but one is more important. So advocates argue that there were a number of negative effects but the main driver was religion uh, and belief in the importance of the family. And so now you've taken all the sources and you put them together. And that counter evidence, first of all, shows your, your audience that you're being totally transparent, you're not hiding anything. It shows that you've done a lot of research. And it shows that this is complicated, which is really what historians wanna see, right? We don't wanna see a perfect Thomas Jefferson um, or just a, a Thomas Jefferson who's just a, a, an unredeemed villain. Like, we want to see complicated people, complicated events, messiness. So my suggestion with students who are uncomfortable about, oh, I don't want to put the counter evidence in there, it's going to undercut what I'm saying, is to say, like, embrace it, go right for that. You can keep building your argument that way by then showing what kind of evidence you found to suggest that one side of the scale is more important. That's a really nice way to segue into this larger uh, question of historical interpretation that we're gonna deal with um, tonight and in our last webinar. And this is the process by which we start to put these sources together and make them into something like a coherent argument. I spent a lot of time at the beginning of every school year talking to my students about what argument is and, and getting them to define it in their own words. As a historian, I think a simple answer is just, it's a claim about the past that is supported with evidence from primary sources. That doesn't mean that all arguments are created equal. And I think the best ones are ones that have some grit to them because they're not obvious. Um, I like to look for, or I like to think as a test is, the idea that you've you got a good argument if you have so, something that somebody would argue against. And this becomes a real problem with a lot of my students, uh, particularly when they're doing their first research projects, that they don't want to stake out very ambitious territory. And they don't want to say anything that might be wrong because they have this idea if they ask themselves a really interest, a really straightforward question, they give a straightforward answer and they say, great, I did it, I gave an argument and nobody could push back against it. So like, here's a, an argument, like in the 1990s, the Chicago Bulls were the dominant team in the NBA. The, the issue with that argument is it's just not very interesting. It's gonna be hard to find too many people who are gonna say, no, the Chicago Bulls did not dominate the 1990s NBA. It's ridiculously easy to prove that. Um, you could say, the 1963 I Have a Dream speech, that was an important moment in the civil rights movement. And you could demonstrate the truth of that, but nobody is gonna get up and argue against you. Nobody's gonna say that was an unimportant movement that nobody really thinks about or refers back to. And so this is a question of sort of setting the bar so ridiculously low that it's easy to get over. And I'm constantly pushing my students to challenge, to write more challenging arguments. Um, I think of it as like Olympic diving. So it's not just whether you pull the dive off, but also the degree of difficulty. Um, these really um, sort of artificially simple questions are called straw men. Um, and a straw man argument is an argument that um, is too weak to defend itself. So, you know, no, 
the I have a dream speech was not a very consequential moment. That's a straw man. If you're trying to, to, to beat that argument, you're going to win, but it also tells you maybe I'm not asking a very good question. And so often there's a way to pivot off one question that's a little too simple into something a little more complex and then, you know, a little more interesting. So Martin Luther King Jr. was a key figure in the civil rights movement. Who's taking the other side of that? I mean, that's not something I want to sit down and re read a National History Day project about. But we could pivot. Um, and this statement is a little different, but it's much more interesting, I think, because it says uh, it was King's intellect and religiosity that made him the key figure of the civil rights movement. So now we've got two interesting things there. First of all, it's named particular characteristics that were part of King's um, persona and influence. And it's also said he is the key figure. And now there's places where somebody might say, well, I'm not sure it was those things. And as a test, you can go out and say, like, well, what would the other side of that argument look like? And in fact, in some of the more recent scholarship on civil rights, you'll see sentences like that last one, which say most of this work is being done at the grassroots level. Um, and so there is no one key figure. You know, there, there's a symbolic importance that King has, but getting things done happens someplace else. The fact that you've got Two sides that can both say, I've got primary sources and I'm going to make my case here, tells you you've got a, an argument that has some traction to it. And set, so setting up uh, a good question that has an argument that you can, you can put forward and that somebody else might uh, you know, put up some resistance to, or the counter evidence piece, is really critical. And the, the thing I want to cover before I hand the baton to Lynn um, is to think a little bit about description and analysis in your writing. And, and we're going to be focusing tonight, um, particularly in the last session, about diagnosing your writing and your students' writing and trying to figure out what kinds of signs to look for that tell you you're on the right track. I think of sentences broadly in, in these two kind of categories. Um, the descriptive writing is those first journalist questions, the who, what, when, and where. Analytical writing is the why and the how. So one big set of questions that we often think of together, but I think there's actually a significant distinction between the two categories. We can think about descriptive writing as presenting facts and analytical writing as offering meaning. And I've used yellow and red to, to set these off. So those are the colors to pay attention to in the next couple of exercises. Um, another way to think about, you know, facts are just, you know, things that are objectively true and that we can show with primary sources. Meaning is the interpretation that we put on that set of facts to tell readers why it's significant. Description is usually fact-based. Analysis is usually focusing on meaning and significance. Um, description is a lot easier to write. And if you're, and, and sometimes easier to read. So this is, you know, narrative history that says first Washington got up and then he went here and then he received his mail and then he set off on his horse. That's description. Analysis is the part where the real history happens, where we start doing interpretation. We start putting meaning on these sources. Um, do two quick exercises to kind of walk you through what I mean. And then we'll, we'll do a little think aloud where you get to do the process yourself and participate in a poll. Again, forgive me, got Civil War stuff on the brain, uh, but I love using these Library of Congress sources and the great map of the armies converging at Gettysburg. So I wrote up a little stub to use in my class um, to describe what's happening in, on the 1st of July, 1863. Um, and if you're going through this, you might say, all right, well, is this, is this description or analysis? Um, well, let's just go sentence by sentence. Confederate Army smaller than the Union Army, all right, that feels like a fact. Um, so I'm going to highlight it yellow. Um, the men marched on short rations and without shoes, also a fact. They were confident of victory, also a fact. We could show that from primary sources where men just say explicitly, we are confident of victory. Um, and they arrive on July 1st. Great. I mean, everything in that paragraph is historically accurate, but there's no argument there. It's just a list of factual observations. And often my, my students, especially when they're starting out, 
will turn in long essays and long research papers that are 90 to 100 percent description. Description's fun to write and it's easier to write and you feel comfortable about it because you're not really sticking your neck out because these are all facts. Nobody's going to argue about the day that they arrived at Gettysburg and so you, you feel like you're protected, but you're not really advancing any argument. So let's take another crack at this paragraph and see kind of sentence by sentence what's going on here. Um, and when I first started doing this, I, I absolutely went through my own writing sentence by sentence with highlighters so that I could visually see how much of each thing I was doing. And, and I did that until it became a kind of natural habit. Um, first sentence, we start out with a fact, but then there's some meaning, right? There's a, there's a claim there. Numbers are not going to decide the outcome of the battle. More interesting and actually something someone could push back on. Um, this one blends both but has them inverted. So there's a because, because they had done this one thing, therefore they marched towards Gettysburg confident of victory. So we've got a fact, but it's also attached to an insight. And then this last thing is just a claim, right? You can't prove that from primary sources, but you've made an argument now. And now as a reader, I'm thinking, oh yeah, like I wanna keep reading because I wanna see if this person can convince me of this. Um, I have something to push back on and, and your reader is engaged. My students come in with first drafts that are 100% uh, or 90% description and I am pushing them to get that ratio to like 50% facts and 50% analysis. You need to have facts in there too. The facts are the things that are going to support your analysis and make them more than just your opinion. Um, but I think 50-50 is good to aim for. The red sentences are often harder to write because it's forcing you to do thinking rather than just repeat, uh, repeat facts that you found or put facts in order. I do this exercise with my students and I, I started doing it when I was still a graduate student working as a TA and we would do it with highlighters and I would have them do the diagnosis. And then we would talk about, you know, whether there was too much yellow or not enough red and it's a great technique to start working students through these questions of, well, why do you think this happened? Well, what do you think this means? And often it's that that gets them thinking about the significance. Um, there's also little words and phrases that key you into what kind of writing you're looking at. So while and because, it's a little flashing signals to readers, like I'm making an argument now. I am showing cause and effect. Um, if you know that there's signals for readers and you tune into them when you're reading, it's a useful arrow in your quiver to deploy as a writer. Um, let's do another kind of similar exercise. Uh, this one revolves around some of the fantastic World War II propaganda posters in the Library of Congress. I love using these because they're so gripping and they work with all sorts of age levels and because um, it's a great time for students who are, you know, maybe don't think of themselves as great writers, but they get to work with images and deploy a whole different set of skills. So it's a great leveler in my classes. Here's a, a quick kind of stub of a paragraph. Um, shows a sailor drowning, the background is inky black, white lettering reads someone talked, only the sailor's head and arm are visible, the subject's pointing at the viewer, it's from 1942. All accurate, but also not really interesting because it's just describing something that I can see myself. It's not putting any of the historian in there. Um, we could take a lot of those same facts and weave some more analysis and interpretation in here, which now makes a comment about the mood, that the mood is, you know, feels dark, um, that the finger the sailor is pointing is an accusatory finger, not just a finger. Um, and then it makes this last claim about what the poster is trying to do. So there's some factual stuff in the paragraph, which is really critical because you wanna show evidence for the claims you're making, but there's also some interpretation that is showing why this is assembled in this way and what it means about the first part of the American war effort in the 1940s. That interpretation, the analysis, the meaning, that's has to be applied by the historian, by you as a teacher, or by you as a writer, or by your students as writers. Is that that's how we show cause and effect. You can't just pile a whole bunch of facts on the table for your reader and say, there you go. 
Interpretation analysis is the way that we assemble the facts into meaning and try to show cause and effect and change over time. That really is the heart of historical interpretation, thinking it that way in broad strokes. As my students get more confident, I start um, talking about what the most effective historical interpretation does, which is go beyond just the list of facts and start creating some sort of structure that a reader can find persuasive. And hopefully that a reader finds contentious enough and not so obvious that the reader still wants the answer to the question, wants to be persuaded. Okay, um, this is broad stroke stuff. We'll, um, we'll be returning to these ideas about diagnosing your writing and your students' writing um, in the last webinar. As I said, the real main course tonight uh, is Lynn's description of um, a kind of visual way to think about this process. But just as a quick test, uh, I'm going to put up uh, three paragraphs and I want you to really quickly look at them. Just go sentence by sentence and if, you know, use your, your mental red and yellow highlighters. And then see whether you think it is mostly descriptive, mostly analytical, or a mix. And I'll read them out loud and I'll leave them up as the voting starts. Uh, but don't overthink it, just jump in. So first one. The election of 1876 was the most important and consequential election of the 19th century. The Republican candidate Rutherford Hayes only prevailed because self-interested politicians in his own party struck a correct bargain to deliver the victory, and that bargain was the reason that Reconstruction failed to deliver racial justice to Southern blacks. Where would you put that down? Mostly descriptive, mostly analytical, or a mix of both? And please, as always, no wagering. Helps, if I, unmute, helps yeah. if I unmute myself. All right, we're up almost 80%. If you haven't voted, let's go vote. Don't stress on the answer. Go with your first guess. Yeah, and I cannot stress enough, like, don't worry about the right answer. The point is not getting the right answer. The point is just forcing yourself to think about it, right? All right, here we go. 12% of you said mostly descriptive, 59% analytical, and almost 30% said both. Okay, this is, these are tough because there's, there's some, some overlap, but I wrote this one up to be mostly analytical. It's really hard to be purely one thing or the other, but I tried, if you go back and look at that slide, try to really stress things that are not fact-based, and each one, it was my spin on why something happened. Let's play again. Uh, Harry Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852. It would go on to sell 300,000 copies in the United States. The evil slave owner, Simon Legree, became one of the most infamous villains of 19th century fiction. Oh, now we're ready. Now we're voting very quickly. Ooh, this is an interesting result here. All right, let's go. Last clicks. All right, so our group is responding. 79% descriptive, 2% analytical, and 18% a mix. Awesome. Uh, so that was one that I was aiming hard for descriptive. And if you go back, so, you know, just if you're inclined, go back and watch this tomorrow and look at the sentence again. Each one of those things is a fact. You couldn't really take issue with any of those lines. Like, the book did sell this many copies. That's not really... Uh, in debate. Like Simon Legree does come out this way. That's not really a debate. So I was trying to be much more descriptive. As a result, that paragraph doesn't really do that much for you because you're just like, well, now I know some things about Uncle Tom's Cabin, but I don't have any idea why I know those things or what is useful about them. Uh, let's do one last one. Um, again, just kind of making my way through the collection of the Library of Congress or interesting things that caught my eye. The Equal Rights Amendment, first approved by the House in 1971, remains one of the great missed opportunities in American politics. The amendment enjoyed bipartisan support in Congress that eventually received 35 of the required 38 state ratifications. Ultimately, it was doomed by the work of Phyllis Schlafly, who argued that the amendment would actually leave women with fewer rights by removing legal protections and exposing them to the draft. All right. What do we think? Descriptive, analytical, or mix? Go ahead, last votes. All 
All right, this one was pretty clear. 2% descriptive, 7% analytical, 90% went for the mix. And, and that was what I was aiming for. And if you go back and look at that paragraph, I also think that that's the one that works the best as a piece of history because it puts in details and facts, but it also says, this is why it failed or like this was the biggest missed opportunity. So it's got some things that say 35 or 38 ratifications, but it's got other things that say, you know, that the historian is saying, this is what this means. Um, if you go back and read the, especially the Uncle Tom's Cabin paragraph, it wouldn't work great as a standalone paragraph because it doesn't offer much except here is a pile of details about this book. And so there's nothing for me to say, well, that's a great set of details, but what have they told me about the past or abolition of the 19th century or anything? Um, that's a, a quick broad brush strokes. Um, I'm gonna pass the baton to Lynn who is going to give, a, and I'm gonna sit here and take notes, gonna give a great kind of visual way to organize notes, but I will be here on the line and ready for Q and A afterwards. So if you've got questions, I will still be here to answer. All right. Well, thank you, Christopher, for that transition. Now, let me give a quick preface here. My first five years teaching, I taught seventh grade. And I love seventh graders. And I love seventh graders because I think they're a very unique combination. I would always describe seventh graders as seventh graders could get to a point where they could make an amazing intellectual connection. They could finally understand how A leads to B and what the effect is to C that same child five minutes later could fall out of his or her own chair, not be pushed, actually fall. And that's what I always thought made teaching seventh grade so interesting. So I was really grappling driving to work one day, not that anybody lesson plans in the car, not that I ever did that, of course, um, you all know what I'm talking about. Trying to figure out how in the world I was gonna make this concept of building an argument make sense to my seventh graders. And I worked on a team, I had some seventh graders who were working up almost at a high school level. I had other kids who were working at you know, second, third grade level with all kinds of emotional learning challenges. You name it, they were on our team. And I had five classes during the day and 156, I think, kids on the team that year. And I was trying to figure out, okay, how am I gonna do this? And I thought, okay, I have to make it visual. If I can make it visual, that's gonna help. And so I kind of sketched something out on my mind that ended up on my board when I went to class. And what this became known, or what I always used to call this, is the R triangle, the A-R-E triangle. And this is how I would use to help students visualize how we do this. Remember, I'm starting with seventh graders. So I would start, if, you've, if you teach seventh graders, you know that a lot of seventh grade is about establishing independence, right? And a lot of that comes with, I want something. I want a phone, I want a bike, I want to, you know, fill, fill in the blank. So I would start with that. Start with where they are and what they understand. And we would work together as a class to map out an argument for something that somebody wanted. So here's an example, and quite frankly, when you did this, a lot of them ended up as variations on something like this. The argument is what does the student want? They want a new bike, they want a phone, fill in the blank. And you'd say, well, why do you want it? And when you really boil down to the why, the why would be something about I'm being more responsible, I'm doing a better job. And now that's interesting, that's your reasoning. And that's really interesting because that's something we can argue with. And just because you say you're responsible, doesn't mean I have proof you're responsible, right? I'm gonna look for that proof as your teacher or as your parent. And so this is where we would start talking about, well, how do you prove that you're responsible? And we would use examples like keeping your room clean, getting up for school, babysitting, having a small job, keeping your grades at a certain level, or in this case, one of the students was like, yeah, I'm just too tall to ride my bike. And you know, you could look at these kids and sometimes they just did pop up and were too tall. And we'd break it down and I would say, okay, the argument is the case that you're trying to make. The because is the reasoning, the why. And the evidence is the proof, right? The evidence is things that I can check. I can check and see if your room's clean. We can count up how many days you got yourself to school on time. These are things that are facts that we can check. And once you kind of establish the triangle, we always talked about a triangle has to be heavy at the bottom, right? There has to be proof. If you just have one thing, you don't have a good argument. You need multiple proof to really ground your triangle. And that's why your triangle starts small and goes big. So we take this concept and we transition it over to history. And this is the tough part, but this is the part where the visual was really, really helpful. 
So what I decided to do was to play in a different sandbox than y'all are playing in. So I'm going to play in the women's suffrage sandbox. And I'll be honest with you, Ashley and I worked together and she's a really good researcher. And I said, okay, I'm going to put a time limit on you. You have one hour. You may use the word women's suffrage or woman's suffrage. And I need you to come up with 10 or so resources from the Library of Congress. And I didn't put parameters on. I didn't tell her what my argument was. I said, just give me some sources and then we're going to develop it from there. So she did a little digging and here's some of the things she found. So we've got a picture here of a protester outside of a union for women suffrage in Washington, DC. Uh, we've got a newspaper article where women suffrage is ably discussed by a Mrs. Elizabeth Smith Miller, uh, one of the oldest advocates of the message. Uh, we've got a flyer that's being handed out, uh, the woman's reason because, that gives a bunch of reasons why women should get the right to vote from the Woman's Suffrage Party uh, based in the Metropolitan Life Building in New York. Okay, that's kind of interesting. We've got pictures of parades. There were parades held in 1913 and 1917 uh, that kind of give some interesting visuals of ways that the message was communicated. We've got sheet music. There are songs written for votes for women. Uh, this one I especially liked because it had the Liberty Bell on it and was written in Philadelphia, which is my home city. We also found these cards and postcards that you could send out that had these images of children talking about little girls talking about why women should have the right to vote. That's kind of different. Uh, we've got an article about Mabel Lee, uh, who's a Chinese American woman who's talking about why the Chinese, in this case, the term is Chinese girl wants vote. We've got the papers of Mary Church Terrell are a really cool gold mine at the Library of Congress. And we've got a speech that she's giving in Zurich, Switzerland in 1919. Um, and she's an African American uh, suffragist. So that's kind of interesting. We also have this picture, a group of African American women uh, ha holding a suffrage protest at the Women's National Baptist Convention. Hmm. So if this is what we have, I'm sorry, we also have an article in The Colored American from Mary Church Terrell, which was a newspaper based out of Washington, DC from 1900. Um, and there's two other interesting sources. One is a group of Filipina women who came to meet, that's Florence Harding in the middle, Florence Harding at the White House. And they were advocating for Philippine independence, remember it's a US territory at this point, but also for women's suffrage. And then there's also a letter uh, from Milagros Bennett de Newton uh, in Puerto Rico. And she's writing a letter to Carrie Chapman Catt talking about the importance for women to vote in Puerto Rico. Hmm, so I've got this collection of sources. And what I've really got to do is figure out what I'm going to do with it. And it's really important that that evidence drives the thesis and not the other way around because it just doesn't tend to work. So what I did is I forced myself to kind of organize these and I kind of felt like they fit into three buckets. My first bucket is this idea of communicating a new image. And into that bucket, I'm gonna put the information that I found, the sources about the parades, the protests in Washington, DC, different examples of women being active in the political process. So giving speeches, passing out flyers, those kind of things. The second thing that I'm looking at as I start to kind of organize this in my mind is the ways in which they communicated, the forms of media. So using newspapers, using, I've read some of the accounts of the imprisonment uh, for those uh, who were arrested after protesting in front of the White House. I've got songs, I've got postcards, I've got a suffrage flag that I've seen in a lot of these images. But I'm also troubled by the fact that I've got this really tough piece of counter evidence that the idea of communicating the rights of women and the need for the vote didn't really cross the color line the way it should have. I've got accounts of um, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, and the idea of first being told she couldn't march in some of the parades, then being told, well, you're going to have to march in the back of the parade, and that's a big problem. Um, 
I see lots of accounts where they're talking about not addressing Jim Crow laws, not addressing citizenship barriers uh, for uh, Mabel Lee and other Chinese American citizens. And I got this problem that in the territories, there's not a push to say that the, when women get the right to vote, that the women in these territories should also get the right to vote. And that's counter evidence. And I can't ignore that, right? I've got to figure out how I'm going to address it. So what I've done is I've taken my buckets and I'm going to create a thesis statement. What I'm going to do with that thesis statement here is put it through the test. So here's my thesis. From 1900 to 1920, the national leaders of the women's suffrage movement changed their communication strategy and promoted a new image of women, which led to the passage of the 19th Amendment. Leaders use various forms of media to appeal to a wide variety of women. However, the lack of understanding of the needs of women of color left many of them without the vote. So let's test it, right? Let's look at those four prongs that we talked about and worked on in module two. Does it set the topic? Yes. I'm telling you that I'm gonna focus on the leaders of the movement. What's the parameters? 1900 to 1920. I'm not going back into the 1840s. I'm not going forward into the 1960s connect to the theme. Yes, look at what I'm doing here. I'm talking not just about communication out, but I'm also talking about understanding how that message is being received or not in this case. And this is an argument. This is something we can differ on. Christopher might read this and go, you know what, it's not really about the communication strategy, it's because of World War I. It's because Woodrow Wilson was in his second term and he didn't have anything to lose. Uh, maybe it's, you know, that we can argue and discuss back and forth. We could also argue about the fact, was it a lack of understanding of the needs of women of color or was it that they just didn't care? Those are things we can argue and we can disagree on because we can find primary sources to support it. So once you've got your sources, once you kind of figure out what buckets they go in, this is where I would take the buckets and turn each of the buckets into a triangle. And again, I would use the triangle about wanting the bike or wanting the iPhone and keep that up on the classroom wall because that's the model we're working with. So let's take that first one, the idea of communicating a new image. What's my argument? My argument is that leaders promoted a new communication strategy. Why did they do that? And use that because there. Why did that? Because they wanted to promote a new image of, of women. What's my proof? Now, here's a key point. Not only do you have to put the proof, but you connect it back. I'm going to show these parade photographs. But then I'm going to talk about how women in the parades were dressed as teachers. They were labeled as garment workers. Women who were college graduates wore their caps and gowns. New image, not just that they're in a parade, but how they're dressed in the parade. That's part of the new strategy. I'm going to use that evidence about protesting in Washington. And I'm going to talk about how they were demanding change, about how they were embarrassing the president by making comments like referring to him as Kaiser Wilson. I'm going to show that flyer to show that they were engaging people in public, standing on soapboxes and trying to engage others. And I'm going to use the Mary Speech Terrell letter to talk about her giving speeches in Europe. This is a new strategy of sharing it out beyond the U.S. Okay. Do the same thing now with various forms of media. I'm going to turn that into a triangle. How did they do this? They used new forms of media and new venues to communicate their message. Why? Because they wanted to engage people in the discussion and promote their cause. This is where I might talk about newspaper accounts of women, not only the, covering women who are speaking, but women writing newspaper articles. This is where I could plug in that article from the Colored American. The idea of making the case to target certain subgroups of women and talk directly to them and explain why they should be involved. I could look at the postcards and the sheet music and talk about how we're communicating images through popular media, through things that people would be hearing or singing or talking about or sharing. I could also use the photograph of the African American women at the National Baptist Convention because that's talking about suffrage in a religious setting, which is a very different context than many of the other places where the message is being advocated. Okay. 
but I still have that issue of counter evidence. I can't ignore it. I've got to address it. So my third triangle, I'm going to make the case that the leaders did not understand the needs of women of color. And my reason is because they didn't see that as a priority over the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. This is where I'm going to start pulling out evidence where I talk about forms and examples of racism within the movement. So excluding African American delegates from the parade, caving into pressure from many Southern women's groups. This is where I'm going to talk about not understanding barriers like Jim Crow laws and citizenship laws. And I'm also going to address the point that the needs of women in the US territories is not addressed. They do not get the right to vote when the 19th Amendment does go through. It takes till much later uh, for that to get passed and for those women to get enfranchised. So I think if you see what we did, we go from the evidence, throw it into buckets, kind of organize it into what it is, and then we build it into an argument using the triangle format. And this takes some time. This takes some practice. It's not something you generally get on the first try, and that's 100% okay. Our students are going to get it on the first try. It takes practice and repetition. Now, what I think is really, really important is to kind of help take your time and work through it. Don't try to dash the assignment off in 20 minutes. It's probably not going to go well. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is print out the argumentation plan that we dropped into the model uh, into the block that has the sources and look at it against the blank one that you're working on and see how I modeled it with one topic and how can you apply that to the next. All right, that's a lot quickly, but we really wanted to save some time for question and answers here. Before we do that, I will do a shameless plug that I did at the beginning. We have a new teacher source book that just came out this week, 15 lessons written by teachers for teachers. Also, if you are virtual and or in a paperless setting, all of the lesson materials can be downloaded as fillable PDFs so students can type their answers right in it if that's something that helps you. So if you haven't checked it out, nhg.org slash 250, 15 lessons, two articles. We, we're really excited about it. They blend history and civics and they cover everything from the French and Indian War to the Americans with Disabilities Acts. So this is part of our new set of efforts that we're working with the National Endowment for the Humanities building to the 250th anniversary of the United States that's coming in 2026. All right, let's stop. I know there's questions in the queue and Christopher and I really want to take our time and address as many as possible. If you've got to go, we do understand. Take a second though, write it down. tinyurl.com slash nhd dash ha21. It's important that we get your feedback and let us know. You like the chat feature? Don't care about the chat feature? Please turn off the chat feature. We'd love to hear what you think of that. All right, I'll leave that up, but I know that there are questions. So Ashley, who's going first? All right, we have a question in from Kristen. And her question is, uh, how do you help students rein it back when their argument is so far out there that they're going to have too much trouble supporting it? I think this is where you got to play a Jedi teacher mind trick. If you just say, this argument is terrible, it will never work. They're going to say, well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And they're going to try to, you have to say, okay, you know what? I'm not sure about this. I need to see some evidence. So, I want you to come back to me with evidence. Tell me what you found. If you can show me that you've got evidence to back it up, let's roll with it. But if you don't have the evidence, and I, I always say they're trying the weight has to be at the bottom. If you don't have at least three things to support what you're saying, if you're relying on maybe one newspaper article or one picture, that's just not weighty enough. I always just say the triangle's gonna fall over if everything's at the top and nothing's at the bottom. So I think that's where you have, it's, it's kind of becomes a put up or shut up moment, right? You've gotta be able to put up the evidence or we've got to tweak the thesis. And it's important to know, tweak the thesis does not mean throw out all your research and start from the beginning. Think about the example Christopher gave, right? Where it's like, okay, here, here's one argument that's kind of weak, but just by adding one or two sentences and kind of changing the way you look at it or think about it, lets you use the evidence that you do have and that you did find. I see Ashley nodding really broadly and I think it's because we don't ever throw anything out, right? I always open a new document 
And so it's a series of revisions rather than crumpling this up and starting fresh. And once I got students to realize like, we're gonna you know, kind of hop from lily pad to lily pad and we're gonna get to where we're going, the whole trip became a lot less daunting. And I think Lynn's given some great advice there for like, put the burden on the student. All right. So we've got some other really great questions in here. Uh, next one up. Do you recommend incorporating the counter argument into our thesis or just into our research slash analytical writing? I think if you're going to address it in some form, you've got to tease it in the thesis, right? You've got to be able to say, hey, hey, this, this is, but that. You don't have to go into all the detail. Remember, those thesis statements, two, maybe three sentences long. Some of you all have paragraphs. I'm seeing them in the discussion boards. You got to pair those back, right? But they give you the gist. So if you read that thesis statement and then didn't read the rest of my paper or watch my documentary, it doesn't matter. You've got the gist of what it is I'm trying to argue. You won't really know if I did so successfully but that's the teaser, right? That's, it's kind of like the preview, it's the trailer. Do I wanna see the movie? Do I not wanna see the movie? The thesis is the trailer. And if you're gonna address it in your evidence, I think you've gotta to allude to it in your thesis. All right, second question. Um, I see that you've included both parts of the theme, communication and the key to understanding in your thesis. Is that generally recommended? I only had my students focus on communication in history this year. Well, I think one of the points that we tried to make in the theme narrative that Ashley wrote, I'll give her props for that, and the theme video that we produced, is that communication is a two-way street. And while it's all about putting messages out. Like think about um, the propaganda poster that Christopher showed, right? You know, silent, you know, if you don't keep your mouth shut, guys like this poor sailor are going to die a horrible death in the cold dark ocean. We know those messages were put out. There's, you know, literally thousands of examples of them. But we have to also ask the question, did they work? Right? If I put out a public service campaign that tells you to do something or tells you not to do something, that's part of the history. But then we also have to step back and say, well, did it work? Did people listen? Why'd they have to put the posters out in the first place? Um, so Christopher, why don't you kind of jump in on there? Like what's, how do we, when you look at communication in any piece in history, how do you look at the understanding or how do you evaluate that as part of your argument? Yeah, I, I love your description right there. And I think the, um, the idea of stepping back and, and just in the case of that World War II poster, like the fact that that poster exists suggests that somebody in the government thought that people were not going to naturally do that. And so you've got not just the messages being put out, but the audience that's supposed to be receiving it and the degree to which they're receiving it. Frankly, I found your description just really fascinating because I think this is a practical nuts and bolts issue for NHD advisors about, you know, what, how much weight do we put on uh, which side of the theme and to what extent are they um, complementary? I don't think it's, and it's not a 50-50 thing necessarily, because it really depends on the topic you have. Sometimes it's mostly one and, you know, we have to say like, hey, we don't really know how effective it was because of X, Y, and Z, or, you know, we can't really evaluate this new deal policy because Pearl Harbor happens, and then everything changes. And sometimes we don't really know the second half as well. But remember, the big piece about history and the reason why we don't do current events and that we do history for History Day is we've got to see the impact the so what. And the understanding often helps to get to that so what. If you're telling me there was this great campaign during World War II, did it work? Did people build victory gardens? Did people, you know, was there industrial sabotage? Were there people who were protesting against the war? Did this kind of keep them in check or limited their power or their influence in society? That's where we've got to look to get to the so what. And the, remember, the themes are about helping to drive analysis. The understanding helps drive the so what. All right, next question. Do you think with students, we should not start with theme analysis and just have them research a topic? I think the theme helps set the tone for the year. Um, 
honestly, the, the theme helps students kind of think about topics in a different way, because let's be honest, World War II propaganda posters, that could be a topic for like pretty much any NHD theme. We see it every year and that's okay. But it's all about what's the aspect of it, right? What's the turning point? What's the triumph and tragedy? What's being communicated? Whose rights, whose responsibilities? As a teacher, I like to post the theme and I used to just kind of bring the theme up casually. I drop it into class discussion. And this isn't like full lessons. This is, I have two minutes left till the bell rings and it's, you know, turn and tell your neighbor two ways in which somebody was communicating a message and evaluate whether it was understood or not. Go. You'd let them talk for a minute and then I'd say, okay, we got one minute left. I want two 30 second examples to wrap up class today. I would use it. For me, the theme it didn't really matter what the theme was, it got the students talking and it kind of became a theme of the year um, that sometimes led to t-shirts by some of my kids who, they never brought me one, thank goodness, um, but they would tend to write down quotes that I used to say in class, at least this one class really liked to do that. Um, but I think the key is to kind of use that to help drive the analysis, but don't let it take over. All right. Next question. What happens when you have a student or students that insist on using quotes and only quotes to prove their argument? We've all seen those. How can you convince them to read their quotes but not love them so much they insist all of it goes on their exhibit or their website? All right, Christopher, you take this one first and I'm going to take, I'll take on this one. one. Yeah, I'll take this one. And I just had this conversation with a PhD student on Monday and I found myself saying the same things that my advisor had told me way back when. Uh, my advisor was really specific about no block quotes and no standalone quotes. So you could not just have Noah Webster or Ulysses S. Grant or Ida B. Wells saying something. He said, every time you have a, a historical actor speaking, you need to have a, a sentence that says what the significance of that is. So that if you've got a, an eight sentence block quote, you can't leave it out there by itself. You need to, because that's like letting your, your reader walk into a dark forest and you don't know when they're going to come out or where they're going to come out. They may not see in there what you want them to see. And so he said, you have to interlace them, you know, one, one line uh, of your interpretation and one line of their interpretation. So I enforced that rule. How do I get them to believe it? Sometimes I play dumb. I mean, sometimes I, if they just have the quote sitting there, I'll go, oh, wow, Timmy, you know, boy, I see that. I read it like very unironically or very matter of factly, very literally. So, well, that's not what it means. Oh, maybe you need to tell your reader because I got a different idea than what you wanted. And so you can't just allow all of these people from you know, 1920 to speak. Like you need to explain the meaning because you can see things that they couldn't see. Um, and so he, he just kind of said, look, you know, that this is the rule, you have to follow the rule. And then later he explained why the rule existed. You probably wanna start with why the rule exists with your students, but show them like what doesn't happen when they just have a bunch of, here's Martin Luther King, here's Iowa Wells, here's John F. Kennedy, a lot of facts there. You need to give us the, the, the you need to digest it for us, which is, which is the, imagery that my advisor used. I got to tell you, website students are really, really, this, this is for your website students. They love to do that, right? Because They're they the worst. want it's just, to use those yes. primary source quotes and not fill up their word count. And I describe it as dropping the bomb, right? You <laughs> kind of like take paint and you splatter like, here's this quote, here's this quote, here's this picture, here's this map, it's all here. But you're not telling people what to see. You're not saying this map shows the kind of protests that were happening in this picture, which demonstrate the message that they were trying to get at through about X, Y, and Z. Just having that sentence helps to connect the dots. If you drop the bomb, but you don't explain why you dropped the bomb, then you're just kind of kitchen sinking it, right? You're kind of throwing, I'm going to put every primary source that I found into this website, gosh darn it. As opposed to saying, hey, you know what? Maybe you have 20 political cartoons you found, and that's awesome. But which two or three really drive home your point? Because I think sometimes there's a sense that more is better. 
but realistically, that's not how it works. And some of my favorite projects are very simple because they really focus on the analysis and they drive it home. It's not just, here's a whole bunch of political cartoons, but these two cartoons demonstrate this concept as it was playing out in San Francisco, California and Houston, Texas. This is like, I mean, this is a really common temptation for students and for professional historians, this idea of like, well, this source is so good, it speaks for itself. And my advisor would say, Christopher, nothing speaks for itself. Like you have to speak for it. And I would say, well, I, I just would rather just show 20 cartoons uh, rather than tell the reader what they're supposed to think about it. He said, oh, there's a technical term for historians like that. And I said, great. And he said, yes, it's lazy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's, this is good to know. He said, you need to tell me what I'm looking for in this stuff. And you need to, like, that's your job. Well, and think about it from a classroom perspective. And maybe you might want to demo this with your students one day. Just stand up there, put, I don't know, 10, 20 sources that all relate to whatever the topic is on the slide. And just click through it. Say, click, we're going to look at this. Then we're going to look at this one. Then we're going to look at this one. I love this And idea. what's the students reaction yeah. to that? First off, they're going to get bored. Yeah. They're going to wait. They're going to say things. Well, wait a second. Why did you do that? Wait, yeah. I, I wasn't finished or I didn't finish. Re well, you're just, I'm just dropping bombs here. I'm stealing this idea big time. It's like, <laughs> well, you saw all the sources. Like what doesn't make sense? These are oh. the primary sources. They make sense oh. in my head because I picked them. Right. right? <laughs> Think about it. If yeah. I hadn't given a general description of those sources, or I hadn't talked about how I would use those sources. I'm so totally stupid. Then I'm just sticking them in there. It's not just here's the picture of the parade, but here's the picture of the parade. Note that women are wearing caps and gowns because they're college graduates. That's what's important. And that communicated that women were becoming more and more educated. That's my argument. And again, that's where we can kind of use that to support my argument. Christopher can say, well, you know, they really weren't, if you actually look at the education levels, the women weren't going, it's just a small select view of elite women. And that really wasn't representative of all women. And that's true too. And we can sit and argue that mm -hmm. back and forth. So it makes history fun. There's not an answer. It's not two plus two equals four. I mean, it were easy. It'd be math, right? Math is not easy. Oh, it totally is. <laughs> There's answers. They're right and wrong. And I know some of your math teachers out there too, you'll, you'll, disagree with me but there's not a hardcore this is the answer it's like i had asked him like what's the formula to making the perfect history day project there's not a formula good research good analysis quality product but what that is is gonna vary mm -hmm. and it's not one thing so kind of building off of that question lynn um, we have a couple questions on, we have cited websites as kind of giving you that quote tsunami that it takes you out when you look at it on the page. But some teachers have asked, what about the documentary category? And things are kind of coming at you. How do you deal with those kids that want to put every single source they found visually at you? This is the great speed question, right? you have to balance it out. If one image is on the screen for a full minute of a documentary, that's a snoozer, right? But if images are flipping every two seconds, you can't understand them, right? You can't even have time to visually process them. And this is where I think the magic in documentaries is how the narration connects to what you see, whether it's uh, still images or moving picture. So it's not just, we might hear the quote that, you know, uh, President Roosevelt makes, you know, you hear two sentences of the Roosevelt speech, but then the good documentaries, that's where the narrator comes in and offers that analysis, right? The impact of this speech was that this led to X, Y, Z happening. So it's not just, this is what the president said, and then let's do another picture, but it's the, the narration that often does that. It's also like speed of documentary, right? you've got to be able to speak at a pace where people can understand. Because if you start to go really, really fast, then you're going to get a whole lot in in 10 minutes, but we're not going to understand a word that you say. They've got to practice that, right? And oftentimes the first recording is too fast because they're trying to jam in. Or they might go to a regional contest and get feedback and go, oh, we're going to add this piece, so we're going to talk faster. 
No, if you're going to add something in, you probably have to pair back something else. And that's hard, right? That's why there's word limits. That's where there's time limits on performances and docs, because you've got to decide what to pare down. Yes, you need historical context, but if historical context is six minutes of your 10 minute documentary, that argument's just not going to happen. So maybe the feedback is, hey, you've got good stuff in here. What's most important? Let's get that down to about a minute and a half or two minutes and then have the extra time to develop your argument. All right. Can you please explain the connection between the ARE pyramids and the argumentation plan? Do you suggest that we do an ARE pyramid first? I don't see that included in the argumentation plan. Absolutely. Actually, give me just one second here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pull something up that I think might be helpful. And uh, actually, do you want to do you want to jump to another question uh, while I pull sure. this up? I don't want to waste people's time here. Absolutely, I can. Um, how do you get students to understand that quality is more important than quantity? For example, students will list 10 resources and then I ask if they use them and they say no. <laughs> Christopher, you take that one first and I'm going to jump in. Um, so I don't have a great answer here except, well, I mean, to remind them of best practices and then in the olden days when I was a National History Day judge, I'd ask. And I, you know, as an instructor, you might say like, what happens if they ask you what you got out of, you know, Professor Smith's or Professor Jones's book and you say, I never got it out of the library. I just put it in the bibliography. Um, and so I think like the idea of focused but deep research is much better than uh, it, so if you're if you're a judge you see that a bunch of these books are pretty you know that they're, they're all the same right they got a, a bunch of books out of the school library that are all, all on the same topic and they don't need to be there and a good judge might might try to kind of pull that out of a student can you just say like this is generally not going to help you you know if a skeptic came up they would wonder why you got six books that are all on the same subject rather than just you know two books that are on the same topic, but presenting two different sides of it. Absolutely. Well, also too, if it's in there, you better have read it. You better have yeah. analyzed it. You better have looked at it. And, you know, sometimes too, when we start research, we kind of start gathering, right? And as you kind of work through, you're like, oh, you know what? I'm really not going to focus on that piece. Students have to learn that it's okay to delete from an annotated garden, bibliography. Because yeah. right, good practice is we add things as we go. When you get close to contest, sometimes you have to go, you know what? I didn't really use that. Or I, I shifted the, sh the focus of my topic so these letters didn't really play in. Well, just because it's a primary source that you found from a really cool place like the Library of Congress doesn't mean it makes the final cut if you didn't use them. Because if a judge is going to ask you how you use this source in your project, if you can't just say like, oh, well, I got general information from 70% of my sources, you didn't. It's like some of my students will show like, the encyclopedia articles from World Book and Britannica and three other sources. Well, guess what? They all say the same thing, right? If you've got multiple things that say the same thing, focus on the best one that's going to allow you to advance your argument. And I will say from a judge's perspective, the majority of judges are not bamboozled by the fact that you've got 75 different websites in there. Um, they can tell pretty much out of them by looking which ones you probably got the majority of your information and the ones that you used to kind of pad that annotated bibliography and you want the goldilocks effect you don't need all the sources you need the ones that are just right and i'll go a little further on that like when i'm a judge and even when i'm a reader like if there's a long annotated bibliography like that that's a signal to me that this person's trying to put one past me and so that actually gets me to um put them even more under the microscope. So they might be getting unwanted attention, having precisely the opposite um, effect that they think that they're having. Like if you tell your reader, hey reader, I don't think you're very smart or I don't think you're paying a whole lot of attention. That just gets me like, oh, well, let's see what we can do with this. So. All right, let me shift back. Let me share my screen here. Um, thank you for being patient with me there. I pulled up a copy of the sample argumentation plan that we dropped into the course. 
So let's look at what we put into it. First part is the thesis, right? So it's any revisions, anything that you've tweaked. The second part is context. This is like your intro, right? If I'm going to talk about this topic, let's look just a little bit of context. What kinds of things would I need to know a little bit about? And again, this is an intro point. This is not the focus. This would be about a minute, maybe a minute and a half of that documentary. It might be a page of your paper. That's all it is. So don't overthink that part. What do you need to know a little bit about in order to study this topic? Now, take a look at what we did here, the sub arguments. Up here is your argument and your reasoning. The leaders changed their communication strategy post 1900. Why? To promote a new image of women. Underneath that, what's my evidence for sub argument one? Oh, look, I'm going to use the photographs of the parade, but here's my connection. I'm going to note how women were dressed as figures in US history, wearing robes from college graduates, uh, graduates no, cited as nurses, teachers, garment workers, etc. Argument, reasoning, evidence, how it connects. If you notice, these aren't really long and involved. What else would I use? I'm going to use photographs of the protesters. How am I going to use them? I'm going to highlight that these were the first protests in front of the White House, play on the World War I themes embarrassing the president. What am I also going to use? I'm going to use the flyers. And why are those flyers important? How do I connect it back? Because they're actively pushing women into the public sphere. Argument, reasoning, evidence. Then down at the bottom, is the analysis. So what? Think of this. If we were writing this as a five paragraph essay, this is that last sentence. This is the idea I'm going to tack on to the end. So what? Why did it matter? Why do I care? Here's where I'm going to say, okay, in this phase of the movement, leaders were promoting a new image as contributors to the social, economic, and political process. They communicated an image of women demanding the vote, not asking for the vote. This is my analysis. This is why I think my argument matters. This is what my evidence is leading to my conclusion of. Now, key phrase, my conclusion. This is student generated content. Ashley might look at those same sources and come up with a different answer. Same with Christopher and that's 100% okay. This is my words. I'm not quoting from anybody. I'm not pulling from somebody's book about this topic. I'm saying this is what I think matters and why I think you got to listen to my case about why this time period and this event mattered. So it's all in here and we've dropped this model in here per on purpose to give you a model to work from. And I always think if you have, if you're struggling, print out a copy, print out a blank one, start to work, look at the model, see how you can translate it to what it is you're going to do. Because your argument's not going to be the same as mine, but it'll give you a model of the difference between the description and the analysis. All right. Anything to add, Christopher, or would you like to move on to the next question? I'm ready to move on. I All think this right. is great. I'm just like, I'm, if you see me like squinting, it's because I'm watching Lynn scroll through this and figuring right. out how I can use it. So here we go. Our next question. When it comes to getting students to actually analyze those sources in their NHD project, should they be going to the annotations in their annotated bibliography and using some of the material there to help them do that? Is that a good idea? I think if they're doing that, then they're hiding their analysis in their annotated bit. Remember, annotations are not full-blown paragraphs. What it is, how I used it, that's it. Those need to be short and combat. And I'll be honest, we put those changes into the rule book that starts this year, because some of these ones I was getting, I literally, some annotated bibliographies would have two sources on a page, because there'd be these giant paragraphs in between them. And that is not what it's supposed to be. Remember, the project's got to stand on its own. If I see that political cartoon on your exhibit board, I don't know what your analysis is, but I have to go into the annotated bib and dig it out of there. It's not going to work. Remember, the project has to, the exhibit board has to stand on its own. 
while the judges are looking at and reading and perusing, the focus of their time and their attention is on the performance or is on the documentary. The bibliography supports it, it doesn't drive it. I had a professor that liked to tell me, don't put your analysis in your footnotes, because I like to do that. And she does do that. I've read her writing. She totally does that. <laughs> and it's the same with kids. Don't let them put their analysis in their annotated bibliography. If they're putting it there, make them take it out. And if you are looking for those adjusted kind of what does go into an annotated bibliography and what should go in the project, we do have a set of three really short videos on kind of an overview of an annotated bibliography um, the citations piece of an annotated bibliography, and then what should go in those annotations. And you can actually find all three videos um, linked on our Facebook as well as our YouTube. So check them out. And they're even short and they're specifically short so because they're made for students in the classroom. So they run about five to eight minutes. Make them put that analysis on the board, on the website. Don't do what I do and bury it in your footnotes or in your annotated bibliography. And, so and if you're reminds... looking for them on our YouTube channel, one's called What's an Annotated Bibliography? One's called What's a Citation? One's called What's an Annotation? We don't make these hard to find because we want you to find them and watch them. And hopefully that might help some of your students if they're struggling with writing or revising those bibs as they're getting close to contest or if they're going in that regional to affiliate transition. This reminds me of perhaps the single best piece of writing advice I ever got. And it works at, with students at every level from like my nephew in fifth grade to my colleagues who are full professors. And you know, how much should be in the, in the annotated bibliography and what should be in the annotated bibliography and should the argument be in the footnotes? Like you can always, always, always ask the person where would you want to find this if you were the reader or the judge? And, and that habit of stepping outside of yourself and thinking like, oh, if I were judging this, I wouldn't want to have to flip to the annotated bibliography. It feels like more work for me as the reader is often the thing that kind of gets to think, oh, right. Well, the most important stuff needs to be on the board and this other stuff needs to either be removed. But just asking them, where would you look for this? Where would you want to find this? Would, is this a kind of detail that you would want to read if you knew nothing about this? And so much of good writing and revising is just anticipating the questions that the reader is going to have and presenting your arguments in response to those questions in places where the reader is expecting to find them. All right, I'm excited to say this is our last question for the night. So it's, it's always fun to get to say that. And it's actually one that Lynn and I can finally talk about after working on it for over a year. So I'm going to toss this to her and let her shamelessly plug this as well. What is next year's theme and has it been announced? Yes, it has been announced. So we can say it. For, there's about a six month period where it's embargo where we're not allowed to answer that question. The theme for NHD 2022 is debate and diplomacy in history, successes, failures, consequences. Um, we've been hard at work at it, and actually, hello, peek. It's the theme book. Shh, it's coming. Uh, we're actually we're in the editing process now. The week of the national contest, so the week of June 14th, the new book will drop, the video will drop, the theme narrative will drop, all of the new stuff, the graphic organizer for next year, all of that will drop and be available to you. Um, it's still in process. We're working out. We're, we're, we just turned in the second round of edits back to our designer this morning. Um, but there's all kinds of neat articles, everything, you know, kind of looking at debate, looking at diplomacy, looking at different examples from national and international perspectives. Um, so that's what I think sometimes the word diplomacy scares people. We don't want it to scare you. And that's why the lead article in the book specifically is about what is diplomacy. And it's actually written by our friends at the National Museum of American Diplomacy, the people who work at the State Department, the experts in it. Um, so we're excited to drop that. And all of those resources will come available the week of June 14th. All right, should we, is that our wrap point tonight? That is the wrap point. Cool. All right. Well, before you leave, I know there's only like three people who email me afterwards. 
tinyurl.com slash nhd-ha21. That's our thing. Same kind of feedback survey we do every time. We appreciate the feedback. We use the feedback. Um, we respond to that. I actually download two versions of it. I download the next morning and call it that early feedback, and then we do the full version. And the three of us talk back and forth and make adjustments to our plans Absolutely. based on what you say. Um, and we think that's really important that we get your voice in as much as possible. And, you know, obviously there'll be an evaluation survey at the end of the course, but we want your feedback now because we can make changes that go into next month. We can make changes to drop different things into module four mm -hmm. based on what's working, what's not. We also know y'all are working really hard. I know many of you are transitioning um, either in the classroom, out of the classroom, live, hybrid, all kinds of things are happening, especially as the weather's getting warmer. We are hoping that all of you are getting vaccines very, very quickly and are staying safe and staying healthy. We appreciate how hard you are working. Know that we see it. I know that there's a lot of stuff in the press that's not so nice about teachers right now. And sometimes we all need to take a step away from Facebook when we see people saying that stuff on, on Twitter. But know that we appreciate, we recognize, we see. We're here. We hope to see some of you in office hours next week. Again, those times don't work, not a problem. Send me an email, what times, how to contact you. We'll coordinate it and you'll get a note that says, Ashley, we'll call you at this time on this day. Or here's the Zoom. One of our facilitators is going to pop in and chat with you and help you. We're here to help you. We're not here to try to fight you and argue against you. We want to make you a stronger historian, a stronger researcher, a stronger writer. And at the end of that, a better teacher for you and your students. So Thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening and stay safe. We'll see you next month. Stay safe, everybody. Danielle, hope you're having a fun time visiting colleges. You got to tell us where you went last time, next time. Be safe, be well.